I don't know about all of you, but isn't this amazing? Yeah. You know, this is amazing. You know, we've all, there are so many people here with so many connections to Dartington in some way. Either you studied here, you lived here, you taught here, your family taught here, or whatever. And it's, um, it's beautiful. And we've all come together. And I think that there are a lot of lovely people who've spent a lot of time organising this and helping a round of applause, absolutely. I also want to give a shout out to Will and any of our other technical boards around here. years of my life interviewing people because I work in radio, then I might as well do that now. And wouldn't it be great if we could hear from some ex-students, find, find out what they've been doing, uh, the importance of Dartington upon them and upon their life and upon their art and all of these things, hear maybe some wacky stories, I bet we've all got them, and, um, and just share that. And if we've time, there'll be uh, an opportunity for questions as well uh, for our guests. And also, we've got the birthday boy in here as well. So we're gonna be um, chatting to Tony in a moment too. So, um, and forgive me, I haven't actually said, my name's Luke, hello, nice to see you all. If any of you sort of vaguely recognize me, it's because when I was here, I spent most of my time in women's clothing. So if you don't recognize me, that's possibly why. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Please welcome my guests, Liv Talk and Tim Wheeler. I've lived up until 1997 to 2000, the same time as Luke, and I do remember the women's clothing quite a lot and the tight toilet issue that often occurred. That wasn't an issue, it was an issue for everyone else, really. I <laughs> and I did once make Luke dress in drag and perform to a room full of pineapples. Do you know what? How weird is that? You know, it wasn't until Liv reminded me on the phone a week, a week, two weeks ago, she said, you remember that, don't you? No. And it was in the Rat Nemo in the bar, she put pineapples on all of the chairs. And I had to sit there and serenade them. You know, I mean, they're weird. Well, the actual audience had to stand up right at the back. It was all just for the pineapples, all in various states of decay, wearing sunglasses, and you performed to them and some other people. I mean, I'm not surprised they got away in a spaceship I mean, looking at me in women's clothing. I mean, it's bloody awful, really. I know? mean, really, you were one well, of the least of their yeah, visual yeah. troubles. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, I digress completely from the question That's there, right. deliberately. What's it like being back, then? Yeah, it's always, it's always lovely to come back, and it always reveals something else about myself and the arts, and it's... The energy that still seems to be here for Dartington is really amazingly wonderful and reassuring. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 gorgeous to be back. Of course. Tim, so I, I was here in um, eighty two to eighty six. So that's that's forty years ago. Forty years ago. <laughs> oh, that's two generations. That's that's how many Doctor Who's. That's just extraordinary, <laughs> really. You know, and I, I guess coming back, what was interesting was how small everywhere is. And how, you know, sort of the distances between um, higher, close, and here, it, it's only like two minutes, and it used to take an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, just oh, yeah. that's, that's because we were pissed. That was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah absolutely. No, I just, and the smell of places, the smell of polish, the, the smell of the Great Hall, all of those things, incredibly, incredibly evocative, you know. It just, uh, and you go around a corner and you see a little chink in, a, in the wall and that's where you fell or, you know, something that you see or, and, and, and experience and it just brings back a flood of memories. It's, uh, it's been extraordinary, really. And, and yeah, I have no, you'll notice, I have no conspicuous talent at all. Um, and it's been a joy to watch um, performances over the last two days. Just incredible, you know, wonderful richness that, 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 and joy that comes from this place, so yeah, I've been finding it wonderful. Well, look, we're going to be talking about your talent in a while, so come on, um, we, we're going to hear about it. Um, it brings me nicely onto my next question for you both. I mean, Liv, uh, firstly, uh, for those people that don't know you and what you do, uh, how would you describe your creative practice? Who, who are you? 
Um, I'm, a, well, I'm a spoken word artist, but I also uh, make projects. I mean, I, use, I did performance writing here, and then I actually returned and worked as the press officer for Dartington for three years, just as the college was closing. It was a good time. So can I and just say, it's, it's, it's Louise's fault. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not my fault, I'm not taking responsibility. But what I did have to do for three years is explain to people what Dartington was. So I felt that, you know, and, that, and then eventually I just thought I can't, yeah, continue to do that. But, um, so I, I feel like I've had a lot of time to think about Dartington in my life. But what do I do? I, 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 it took me a long time to do this for a full-time job. And I always like to say when I left Dartington, the day of our degree show, they said to us, the guy doing the talk said, it will take you five years to make any money out of your art if you persevere, and then 20 years to be able to do it full-time professional. And I did think, did I even start? Why didn't you say that on the, well, on the UCAS form? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was completely true. Yeah. <laughs> it took me 20 years to be able to do this full time, and I worked a lot in, uh, in uh, arts marketing and the arts in the environment sector. So I, I have always driven by a desire to kind of save the world in some way, and I've done that in different, I've tried to do some kind of good in some way. So, yes, I facilitate, I run workshops, I run projects. Um, I produce, I make films, but it's all kind of with a spoken word core, and I perform. I run the poetry stage at Waymad. I run, you know, quite big projects now. Tim. So, um, I guess the next thing I'm just about to do, uh, mid-November, I'm going to India, to Calcutta, and I'm working with a, an organisation over there, uh, and we're creating, we've just um, formed a new theatre company, uh, a company made of disabled artists uh, from Calcutta. And uh, that, that group is going to um, tour uh, an adaptation of uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland wow. in Calcutta uh, and the Sundarbans. So it's going to tour around. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's the centenary of the poem uh, this year. And it's also the 75th anniversary of uh, Indian independence. So that's why the project is, is being funded by British Council. And, uh, and um, you know, what, hopefully the legacy of this is there will be a company that is there now in Calcutta who will start to doing, uh, doing work. Um, Calcutta, the place where Tagore was, you know, the, the connection between Calcutta and here is absolutely evident and, and critical to our understanding of art. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a joy, again, you know, an opportunity to work with a group of really talented disabled people. I've already worked with them earlier on in, in March and April this year and we devised the project it's a bit crazy um, because it's a mixture of Tagore, uh, Mahabharata, uh, um, The Wasteland it's kind of inspired by the poem rather than a retelling of it so yeah I mean, what was interesting just about that was that um, in 1911 when the, uh, when the Raj was still there when we were still haunting India um, the, uh, the Sundarbans, which is this beautiful part, it's a river delta, it's the bit that joins um, the um, uh, Bengal with uh, Bangladesh. And it, it's, it, uh, it was described in the uh, 1911 census as a wasteland. They described this whole area as a wasteland. It's, it's, it's a lung of the world. It's like the Amazon rainforest, yeah. you know. It's that important. Yeah. And, and we described it as a wasteland. But when we spoke recently on the phone, you told me something very interesting, that you actually, uh, pre-Darlington, was a maggot. I was, yeah, I left school at 16. Um, I, was, I left school at 16. Um, I was absolutely rubbish at that time, um, at education, and I was a maggot farmer. Um, so we, we uh, so I, I uh, 2,000 gallons of maggots a week, um, and we used to colour them in different colours. Um, and uh, they're for fishing. That's, there, there was a purpose to them. Yeah, um, yeah just didn't do it for fun. You know? yeah, yeah. So, so that was my first experience of work at 16. Um, I, you know now, you know, we talk about working class and that kind of thing, and that, the, the new index of, of, of class is, is basically, um, are you, um, you know, what, was your what were your parents doing when you were 14? That's how they define now what your class is. My dad was in a psychiatric hospital at that time, and my mum collected money for the RNIB. You know, she'd go around and collect those collection tin, tins from various places. So, so my experience is that, you know, I came from quite a, a difficult background, 
I, and I, I came here and my mind blown every single day. What I want to know is what were your first impressions arriving here at Dalton? Well, I, 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 I applied three times and got in three times. And each time I was supposed to get A-levels and I just was shit at, 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 at studying. And each year I failed. And eventually Joe Richards, who was here yesterday, um, he, uh, he wrote to me and he said, look, save you you know, collecting your pension by the time you get here. <laughs> Come along next year and we'll just give you an unconditional office. So, so, yeah. so they did. Yeah! Oh, you yeah. Know. yeah. That, that was what Dartington was about at that time. You know, seeing something, a glimmer of something, and investing in it. You know, and I think that, I, I, just my life would have been so different had that not happened. You know. I'm sitting outside the library under those big pine trees waiting for my bus home. That's my memory. I'm thinking, oh, I want to be here more than anything in the whole world. Um, and just, and then started working at my A-levels after that, after I came here and realised there might be a place I belong. And I think that's, for me, it's like, okay, Dartington is a place people fall in love with. It's also a place that breaks your heart. In, in, I don't think anywhere has ever broken my heart as much as leaving Dartington, anything in my life. And, and, I, and I just sort of believe, it's like when you're in one of those relationships and you're not necessarily in love with that person, but although you might be with Dartington, but you're in love with who you are when you're with that person. And I think that's kind of a bit like what Dartington is. We're all in love with who it lets us be. And then you leave and you can't be that person anymore. And that is heartbreaking yeah. in lots of ways. And you, you know, a life journey to find your way back to that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it just is magical and emotional and it felt kind of profoundly <laughs> spiritual as in, do you need to come here? Mm -hmm. This is where you need to be. And, um, and still, I will take a moment in the gardens if I'm here and sit down and think about that, about that journey and, and what it lit in me, yeah. you know, back then. And, yeah, so grateful. And also the pain. Because when, when you love, it hurts, right? So, you know, but thank God there's places like this that provoke that level of love. Yeah, maybe that there was someone here that was actually really important in your journey, a tutor or someone, maybe a friend. And I remember particularly, who sadly passed away now, uh, Bob Gilmore, who was a phenomenal man, to the knowledge that man, but a beautiful man, a beautiful soul, absolutely gorgeous. And he had such an impact upon me. Um, Liv, uh, I was going to ask you, I mean, if, the, if there was someone or something here which really had that sort of impact upon you, do you, do you who, who was it? I, 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 I don't know, I think it was just, the people, the other students, the kind of the passion we all, I mean, we really believed in this. It was like, you Even know, pineapples. Yeah, yeah, I mean, pineapples, <laughs> I also ironed fish for my degree show whilst wearing a sou'wester to the shipping forecast. I really hit the big, <laughs> you know, I, and I'm very grateful to that, you know, to that experience of absurdism. But yeah, just, just the, I can't think of a particular tutor, I mean, that stands out above the others, but just, yeah, just the landscape, actually, yeah. the actual place, uh, and the, the other students, and the adventures, and the love, and the magic. Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so many people, I think. Uh, I mean, it just, just an extraordinary group of people. And, you know, both um, the lecturers who are here, the tutors who are here, and also visiting, we have people like Adrian Mitchell, the poet, you know, oh. just the most extraordinary. Um, you know, people like Steve Paxton, who's, you know, contact improvisation, absolute key artist in the world at that time, you know, came and we got a chance to work with them. I think the person that I... I connected most with was uh, Keith Young, um, who was just an extraordinary soul. Um, I did a, a lot of work uh, outside of college, outside of college time. We used to go on a Wednesday every every week to a place called Ockham House, which was a, a residential home for learning disabled people, and work, would work with him. And to see him, um, you know, uh, his inspiration as a teacher here but actually in place, working with communities, working with people with learning disabilities, and in, in conversation with people in a most extraordinary way. I think that's what I gained most from him. I, I, and again, just, you know, what, the thing that he said to me, I, I got the, you won't get paid for a long time. Um, but the other one was, remember you're weird. Uh, I think that's absolutely <laughs> critical, wow. you know. And I just, just, whenever you go anywhere, remember 
you are weird. Yeah. And that is just such an important thing, you know. You, 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 will, you will just by nature stand out, you know. And, and, and I think that was, that was absolutely critical. Um, I, work, I worked with him in a psychiatric hospital that was closing down. In, uh, um, you know, uh, and, and again, just an extraordinary person. I, I was saying. No, yeah, I remember your weird. Well, absolutely. Well, I, I, I remember he, he, he let me loose on this group of patients once, and um, and uh, I, so I, th I, I thought, I, you know, I, 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 I thought I'd instill them with my knowledge of theatre. So I started talking about Greek theatre and this kind of thing. And they looked at me sort of slightly non plus, but I was trying to say, you know, at one point, you know, there was a chorus of people would come together in Greek times and and sing in the open air, uh, and then periodically. Uh, a person would step out of the, the chorus and they would speak and they would speak a monologue yeah and and that's what happened you know so we had the chorus and the and the monologue and then some one day this other person came along and took another person out of the chorus and there were two people on stage and they took it in turns to speak so we had the monologue where one person spoke and we had a duo you know what do what do you call it when when there are two people speaking and there was silence in this room of of patients and I can't emphasize what I mean, and I said, you know, what do you call it when there are two people speaking with each other? And, and somebody put their hand up and said, two monologues? <laughs> and I kind of went, no, I mean dialogue. <laughs> but then I thought, actually, how often are we engaged in just overlapping monologues? Yeah. You know, how often <laughs> is it? An example it? here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. No, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, do, do you know what I mean? We don't, we, you know, and... You know, dialogue is about listening, conversation is about listening, and I, I, all the work that I've produced since, since that experience, is a, it's about being in conversation with people and making work out of conversations, mm -hmm. I think. You know, we've been talking about the people that have influenced us and, and, and our arrival at Dartington, but, you know, maybe not getting philosophical about this, but, you know, what makes, and open to you both, what makes this place so special for you? Everyone has a sense of ownership over Dartington, yeah. um, which, which is as much of a problem as it is a blessing, I think, for, for Dartington. And um, yeah, well, again, it is that people fall in love with it, that it, they get to be themselves in it. And I think that's very special. And I, I also think there's nowhere else really that allows you to experiment and really have that freedom to really, it's, it's very magical. Yeah. In the, in the, and I, I think it's part of the jigsaw puzzle to becoming successful artists. I don't think it's the only part that you'll need, but so many people in the arts world don't have this part of their jigsaw puzzle, and the arts world is is poorer for it, yeah. I believe. But um, yeah, it's it just, it gives you permission, it's a place of great magic, great ideas, um, I think it's best when it's doing education, personally, you know, as well, I think, because it's not that great at manifesting actual action, but what it is great at doing is providing space for people to really be and explore who they are and ideas, yeah. and that is... It's great strength, yeah. yeah. Anything to add? Uh, people, places, things. I think it's about those, and it's about, and actually, you know, it's a kind of, it's, it, it's a form of, uh, well, it's, it's the closest to a good addiction you could possibly have, I think, just with those, you know, the, the, the fact that people matter so much, and the places ma the place matters so much, and the things, the objects, the, I mean, just reconnecting with the sculptures, you know, is just the joy of the trees, you know, the way they speak to you continuously, you know, it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a, Caroline was saying it earlier on, you know, it's this, it's, it's this sound, the back, the back score, if you like, to everybody's experience, the trees are just talking with each other constantly, aren't they, and it's just a wonderful place to be, the smell of the, you know, uh, 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 of the spaces, you know, that matters so much. Yeah. I'm exactly the same. You mentioned smells. You, you only go back down to lower close in those music studios. It's going, oh, the smell in there hasn't changed. So one of the first things uh, I, I witnessed uh, was uh, James, um, uh, was a fellow student of ours, uh, who, exceptionally thin, lovely chap, uh, who took to wearing a lot of UPVC dresses and things like that. <laughs> and one of the first things I experienced, you know, some sort of form of art, was him hitching it up. And, urinating into a pint pot sort of thing and it's it's just amazing the sort, the sort of stuff which we could get away with here because yeah. I saw him do it to an ashtray I didn't see you know maybe say it was an ashtray it could have been two, two occasions I'm, I'm sure I it wasn't his first radio <laughs> <laughs> I 
I tried to get over that one, but it was um, but it's the location to Totnes as well, and other places around, and and all former students living nearby, and just how tolerant and accepting uh, people were nearby that we could actually just do what we wanted to do. I never forget walking down the drive uh, late after some summer ball or whatever, and I was was in full drag at the time, but I was absolutely hammered, and it was sort of four or five in the morning. And I met the postman, um, the, the milkman coming up the other way on the float. And they're just so used to seeing all of that stuff. You know, he just went, morning. And went to the it's like, I just love that. It's just like, because I looked a mess, you know. Holes in the tights because I've fallen over five times, you know. Awful. And, you know, mascara all the way down the face. Um, but anyway, there we are. Um, how, before we get on to invite Tony over, um, how important was Darsington to you both in terms of your creative journey and where you are today? I couldn't imagine being on that journey without it, I don't think. You know, I mean, when I, when I, after I left um, uh, college, I, I set up a company called Mind the Gap, which uh, is, being, is still in existence now, you know, it's still making work. Uh, I left it uh, seven years ago now, um, and it carries on because actually it was an idea, it wasn't a person, you know, and I think that's incredibly important, you know, that, that there's some work which is of the person, and there's some work that is in just an idea that needs to be out in the world, and needs to be developing. And I got the chance to create something that's like a kind of mini Dartington, in, in, a, in, a, in a silk mill in, in, in Bradford, you know, and they have a space there that, that, that is completely accessible, you know, and uh, they, they, the, the, the company are able to create work which tours internationally. So, so you know, just having the, the opportunity to create something that has a, has a life and that goes on. You know, yeah. Dartington still exists, hey? You know, the yeah. college is, uh, 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 is no longer here, but it's still, it is still here, isn't it? It exists it to us, absolutely. And, absolutely, yeah. so I think that's critical. Um, yeah, like almost too important for quite a long time. So it was so hard to get back into the world and, you know, the world that just wanted you to work in call centres and things like that. Um, so uh, it was, it, it inspired and ignited something in me that I could never put out and took me a long time to get back to. But now I see I'm using it so much in my career. I've just, I'm, I do, a pro I run a project called Hot Poets, which is about putting poets with climate scientists and helping them communicate, the poets communicate their kind of work. And we've ended up work partnering with the United Nations and I'm off to COP27 in a couple of weeks in Egypt. And just, I can see that the influence of Dartington in that journey, it's not just Dartington, but yeah, just the, the power, the love it gave me to want to keep on making this work. And I just, I, I went to a slam last year and one of the members of the slam took his clothes off halfway through. And I was like, Whatever. Seen it before. Seen it before, whatever. <laughs> but the horror that that struck in the in the spoken word world, it, it caused such an outrage that then, at the beginning of every spoken word event in Bristol, they said, please do not take your clothes off before, before you're, so you're not respecting the other people. And I was like, oh my God, what's happened? We're all so terrified of just like breaking any kind of boundary anymore. And Dartington gave me permission to to play, to be creative. To I did things with pineapples here. I ended up doing a whole thing with bananas where I every morning I'd write my kids bananas before school poem and then you know send that to school and I did it for four years and it became really really popular and I made a book out of these banana poems and you know schools would do it and they'd send me pictures of all the kids holding up bananas and it's just like that's just a lovely thing, and I think that that happened just because of that's the sort of play that I was given permission to do at, at Dartington to just follow the dopamine and just you know to do that. I think Dartington has absolutely been essential to that, and I'm so glad that I had that in my life. But I also know that you need some. It's ma I think the arts being successful is about strategy and magic. And I think Dartington gives you the magic, but not always the strategy. So, um, so you have to go out and find the strategy to put that magic into, um, and that's okay, you know, as Absolutely. well. Yeah. Just thinking, uh, thinking, just talking about uh, new uh, people getting uh, their kit off. Apparently, there was a sign down lower close for people who were walking through the estate. You know, just general ramblers uh, going about looking at birds and stuff. A sign actually saying do be aware that you may encounter someone who is naked. <laughs> um, because it was us, in the not being Honestly, one of the National Trust's most, most popular walkers. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, Tony, um, you know, uh, 
when I was here, you were working in welfare, student welfare and things like this, but I didn't know, sorry, I didn't know, former student, theatre student, what was it like back then? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was 45, so I was a mature student, and it was 1987. Um, I'd done, I performed, did some gigs with Welfare State International, John Fox, and, and gone out down to Damsley, Bread and Puppet, and done a few things with them, and belonged to a theatre group in Bristol, which was a, a community theatre group, and we worked in some of the uh, institutions around Bristol, uh, psychiatric institutions, etc. Um, and then I had a spell as a, a youth leader in the ballets in South Wales, really deprived areas, um, and then moved to Devon and uh, worked with Sue at a uh, place on the other side of Tavistock with uh, kids that has quite severe difficulties, basically, behavioural problems. Um, so when I came to Dartington, there had been quite a lull in, in, in anything to do. We tried to set up our own business, a stained glass, making fairness. Um, and then Ginny, our daughter, uh, wanted to apply to Dartington. But she was 16, she was too young. And I'd visited Dart Dartington once or twice and been quite enamoured. Didn't yeah. know why, it just beautiful place, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I read the prospectus and thought, mm, I wouldn't mind some of that. <laughs> 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 Sue said to me, well, she was working at Plymouth College at the time, she said, well, I've, I've got a job. She said, why well, don't you go and get yourself a degree? Mm. And I thought, do I really want a degree in the mid forties? You know, what am I going to do, sort of thing? But I did. And yeah. I, uh, I applied and they invited me up for a Saturday interview and it was Roger Sell, uh, Katie Duck, um, Yon, wonderful, wonderful Yon. Um, and I wrote a piece for it, and I did various things, did impro, rolling around the floor in the studio, on quite a lot, spent quite a lot of time doing that. And, uh, Can you give us a demonstration now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and got accepted. Got a letter out a week later saying, yep, yeah, okay, oh, Graham Green was there, that's right. Coming up. So my first impressions was, were excitement, but fear, because I'd been out of the loop. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd sort of done nothing. Um, so I'd had a very different life before 1977, uh, that, and I changed a lot after that. Yeah. And this place, the way I didn't continue with theatre practice afterwards, because I worked here for 19 years as yeah. welfare and accommodation, which is theatre in itself, really. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the experience working with I just young people in Spine, I can't work with little kids. I can't work with people my age, they bore me more fucking with us. <laughs> but, but, uh, sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> not you, but adolescents, teenagers, that, that, the growth and the change and all that, I don't just love all that. Yeah. And um, I was extremely fortunate that Janet Ritterman was principal at the time, and when I completed my degree, when I Johnny just opened the envelope that resulted in, she said, will you work for the college now? There was no HR and nonsense like that. Yeah. Those days, yeah. And... Uh, so I, I was union president for a couple of years and working for the college, and it was 19 years, and I never regretted a, a second. It yeah. didn't yeah. inform any arts practice. I have no arts practice anymore, Luke, except coming back to these wonderful reunions. <laughs> but uh, it's a magical place, though. Did you find it's it really supportive amazing. for someone such as yourself of that age? Oh, I mean, what, yeah. So yeah. what's a sort of yeah. what, what's well, your lasting about, memories? The, 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 sorry, what? Well, some of your lasting memories of being on the course. Well, the, <laughs> The ethos was to take a percentage of the course, of the theatre course anyway, of mature students, and I think there were about four. There were only 32 in the year when we started, right. in, our, in our year. Um, it was physically difficult. Yeah. At first. We'd start off with Katie Duck for about an hour and a half in the morning, mm. quick coffee in, over the west wing of the courtyard, and, and then an hour and a half of yawn, and you were on your knees by midday. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was physically demanding. Then in the afternoon, you, you'd get perhaps the electro Richards, yeah. and it would lighten up a little bit, because you could let go, you could improvise, you could do what you wanted to do, or rod sell, and then just investigate yourself, basically. Yeah. And that, that was one, but I loved the afternoon. But I, I loved the mornings as well, but yeah. they were hard work. I had a back problem at the time, and Katie Duck had this wonderful saying where, she, she wouldn't let me do some of the exercises, some of the work in it was Studio 11 and dance school, you'll know it has probably. And uh, I'd be lying on the floor and she said, you can't do this one, tell me, move over there. And I move that way. Right, come back now. Squash them tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> you had to imagine you had tomatoes and you'd go in here and move forward. <laughs> so, but it was working with young people again. Yeah. I was the oldest 
Yeah, yeah. It was, I was the eldest in our year. Yeah. And, and you just get so much energy and, and learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I found. Anyway. Yeah. And openness, you know. Well, not, much not so. rigid, yeah. just kind of explore. Yeah. I, I found that, well, you say that I, so I think some of the young, the outlook of, of some of the younger students was more rigid than some of the mature students. Right. Because yeah. they didn't have life experiences, whatever those experiences had been. Yeah. And, uh, but they loosened up as well. So yeah. You yeah. could teach each other, that was the thing. I had experiences I could relate to them. They had their life, they could relate to me, their current life as well. Yeah. And yeah, so it was great. I think we all had to loosen up pretty fast. I don't know if you all had this, but we had the introductory project. <laughs> Remember that, where you all collaborate together and realize, oh my God, what have I come to? <laughs> it was quite something. Janet Ritterman offered you a job, you graduated here, she offered you the job to stay here. You stayed here for many, many years. What was that like for you? Um, people think I was insane. Absolutely. I think they think Sue was as well, you know. I mean, living under Halter residence for 19 years. Yeah. You couldn't get away from us. You need stamina. Yeah. And earplugs a lot of the time as well. Um, again, it, it, we were lucky. We, we had the flat at Albemarle because Dartington um, Trust at the, at the time said, well, you're working for the college now. How about wardening the halls of residence? Yeah. And Foxhall wasn't open. White House was. That was all and that took. 19, I think, students, that was all. So Foxhold itself, the rest of it, didn't exist as student accommodation. So we just started off with higher clothes. Um, and so they offered us this flat, and I wardened it, and we were a little bit concerned, but it was, you know, living up here, how, you're not going to turn that down, sort of mm. thing. So, and we had a house in Totnes, but we rented it out to students. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, well, <laughs> and family, of course. <laughs> um, it was great. It was great overall. I just try. I just believe you've got to be fair with people, mm. and there were certain things where I lose it. And setting off fire extinguishers, Ben, at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, you can hide some. <laughs> then I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be pleased with that. You know, no. not that they'd have to clear it up themselves, but you know, if there was another fire that night, then you couldn't put the fire out. So that was a danger to life. So that was one. But the, the noise is great. I mean. You, you're 18, 19, you're, yeah. Yeah. you're being yourself, and uh, it was yeah, it was fine. We had a quiet album on itself was designated as a quiet house, yeah. and students could request that on their forms when they applied for accommodation. Do you want a quiet house? Most students put, no, I want the party house. Yeah. Perry. Yeah. Perry. Yeah. <laughs> that was known as a party house. Students that wanted, perhaps they felt they needed a bit of study or a bit of quiet, whatever. Yeah would come into Albemarle. So we, we had a relatively quiet experience up above our heads. It was right. very, very rare when we didn't. But yeah, it wasn't unusual to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go and request a little peace, a little quietness, and especially when the swimming pool was open in the yeah. summer, you know. Yeah. 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 But again, that was, I always, see, I think if people are swimming and enjoying the swimming pool in the middle of the night, and they're not screaming and shouting, then fuck it, enjoy it, you know. And, yep. I mean, I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to, <laughs> I was supposed to go out there and call security and out, 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 out. And I had to want to call them okay. The worst people we ever had in that swimming pool, which my daughter went to, was Larvin. <laughs> We had a larvin course down here. What a pack of animals. <laughs> okay, forget dancers. Students, I find, responded if you trusted them a lot and if you treated them great, then they responded to that. You know, I'm not the type of person to go around and say, I'll do this, do that. I believe people should be allowed to do it. I'm Jerry Garcia. You do what you want. Yeah, you know, yeah. there are no rules as far as, really, as far as. I know they have to be, Luke. I'm not stupid. But uh, generally, I never said you were. Generally, I used to let a lot go. Yeah. Oh, you were the problem child. Um, and, and another thing that you, you know, if for people that were here last night, that you're known for is being a DJ. I mean, how, how did that come about? You know? I don't Well, I mean, I, I DJ in my previous life, before 1977, yeah. um, in clubs and various places and things. Um, I don't know, I had quite a collection, I suppose, and Kevin Wilkins was the president when I was here, anybody yeah. remembers Kev? And uh, we used to do it in the refectory, then, mm. and just set up a couple of decks, and I had some old 45s, and we just started, and 
I have no real memory of how I suddenly really started seriously doing it for the students. Yeah. But uh, they seem to like it, and I love doing it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it took off in the, in the rat, yeah. yeah. The rat named you. I mean, what a name. <laughs> <laughs> the rat named you. There, there was a stuffed rat nailed ab above the bar. <laughs> yeah, that was it, yeah. I remember. And there was an emu, stuffed emu on a stick. In, and then like, like a kid's thing about high in the corner of the stage. And uh, it, so it was known as the Rat and Emu. Yeah. And it was very different to the later students, how you, you, you knew it. The, uh, the bar used to be on what turned out to be the stage in the end, yeah. where the railings are across. And behind that was the cellar. So like when Arnold were playing, when Kev wanted to change a barrel, he had to push his way, move the drum kit. Mm. And push his way back there yeah, to get into the cellar to change the barrels. Yeah. Neil will remember that, probably. I don't remember it as the Rat and Emu, so it must have been that 86, 87 right. when yeah. it changed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, the only thing I remember is the laundry club, which was where everybody went and smoked out. Wasn't that just yeah. the laundry? Are you just, the laundry? Wasn't that just the laundry? That was just the laundry, but we had yeah, the club. Because that was yeah, yeah. underneath the Rat and Emu. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. yeah. Right. <laughs> I thought you smoked in the rat, I'm sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> well, I think the smell permeated the college, yeah. didn't it? Really? <laughs> you know, you really couldn't yeah, get it. Was, yes, you, yes. I mean, we, we had, and you, of course, you were the, the trust that, that suppl supplied the cleaners. Well, the accommodation employed the, the, the cleaners, actually, in higher clothes, yeah. uh, until it was taken over. But uh, they were amazing as well. They knew everything that went on, and they'd cover it for the students, they'd clear them out. Yeah. Myra, if anybody remembers Myra. Myra. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing people, you know, you were yeah. there. Actually, as you said that, I thought, oh my God, those poor cleaners, absolutely. I mean, what they saw they and... It. They loved it. Yeah, that's why they did it. We have one or two that didn't, but generally, Myra did. Can you tell us about when you took shows to end Yeah. Um, well, you know, I didn't have to Edinburgh, I haven't. But um, I went with... Kathy is there, Kathy Kittle. Pete Kittle, like, we, we did Israel in 19... 90 at the ACHO festival, we had students over, um, Israelis and Palestinians, um, stayed at Foxhole for a few weeks in the, the summer of 95, I think it was, the hot summer, uh, or the spring that they were here, and we, we started to build a piece uh, with college students, obviously, and, uh, and then we, in October, we went to Israel and, and completed the procedure of completing the show, putting an end to it, though some of them had been called up and, and were in the services, and, Israel Army, which wasn't a good thing at all, obviously. Uh, so we, we lost a couple, though we did have one young woman that deserted and came right. to join the show. Yeah. Um, so that, that was one of the highlights of my life, to be quite honest, like, to wow. go with Pete Kidman and, and do all this in Israel. It yeah. was absolutely amazing. Um, but shows, I, I did a couple in Glastonbury. I, I, I did Allen Ginsberg's Howl took out with ex-students uh, from here. And we took that to Glastonbury, and I, I enjoyed it. I don't know if it was a success or not, but it was good. Yeah. And then I just wasn't into the responsibility of, of, of doing shows, building shows, organising shows. And so I just used to go to Glastonbury after that and do sort of Celtic storytelling. And I, a couple of years, I took musicians from the musical department here, students, and uh, you know, fiddles and sort of folky mm. to attract a crowd. And then I'd start doing the stories, sort of thing. And I did that with Arabella Churchill for a few years, and then Sarah started taking pieces as well, dance pieces of glass. We said it became quite a family affair, actually. It was pretty <laughs> good. We almost, almost took over the glass and you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, so, anything anyone wants to ask? Yeah, please. Johnny Bunker and Trevor Yule's put on the wasteland as well. In the, that night and in the open air in the field, it was good. No, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping if you, if you want, um, I'll be posting stuff on Facebook, so if you want to follow it, and hopefully we'll be showing clips and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Facebook's the only thing I quite understand. <laughs> so, so apologies if nobody likes it. Uh, yeah. Did you go back and do your I do arts management. I was like, oh, <laughs> boring, boring, boring. I don't know. It's probably I don't know how it works. Um, 
did this thing with us, I think, just, just as we were finishing, which was like, run a theatre company, and we had a week, and we had to set up a theatre company, do a show, and, uh, and all of us, by day two, were bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was the, just an utterly brilliant experience, and yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah. it gave, gave me a complete understanding of what, you know, what, I, you know, microcosm, what I was going on to, you know, and actually, thankfully, never have been bankrupt. In, in, in outside life, but you know, I think those that those kind of things actually giving there were just it's the real experiences being in a psychiatric hospital or a, a residential home or you know yeah, uh, it, those yeah. kind of things were absolutely critical. We had a fourth year in Plymouth, mm -hmm. you know, or in Rotherham, right. where you were just thrown in and you had to make stuff. The Octagon Social Club behind Union Street mm -hmm. in Plymouth, we were doing. Um, you know, circus skills, nail up the nose, walking on glass, bl fire blowing. Everybody just carried on talking whilst we were performing. Yeah. And then as yeah. soon as the bingo started, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then yeah. the meat yeah. raffle. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, learned, we, learned, we learned what the important things were, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the important thing, is you need to... Your, your craft, your work, whatever, has to, has to, it does have to encounter the real world. More audience, but you know? well, I think that's it. More connect, more understanding of audiences yeah. Yeah. and how to hold and host and, and do stuff for people outside of Darcy yeah. you know, yeah. I think would have been amazing. Tony, would you have uh, studied at a different course? Mm. I would like to combine theatre, probably with visual performance or some, some mode of making, yeah, I think, yeah, because I mean, I'm terrible at the moment, I don't. In my life now, I don't feel I have a lot of incentive. I've become quite idle. Um, I still got passion. You shouldn't wait. Waste company, car hinge. I'd like to perhaps do something like that if I had a massive well, uh, welding kit and loads of free metal. I'd like to build something that expressed something, right. and I yeah. probably never will because I don't, don't have the incentive to do it. But I'd like to. I was a student actually two years prior to Tony, 1967 to 69 when Dorothy and Leonard were still living in, in the house. Joe and Richard was actually just the year above us, so it was just a two-year course here. So at, at first I was doing drama and dance, and we had to specialise in the second year, and she was either one of the other, which was difficult. Um, and Leonard, both of them, absolutely lovely, and they would walk around, and at first, coming from school and so on, back in the day then, was sort of in awe of him, and, but he was always so willing to chat and how he got along, what he, what he enjoyed most. Yeah. For me, it introduced me to um, my still absolute love and passion, not only for Darkington, but for India. Um, when I left here, it was the first time I'd heard Indian classical music here. Good art farm, and in that time, in that time, later came in to teach Indian music here as, as well. So, very, very close friends with him, so he died just a few years ago now. Um, then I jumped on a magic bus in those days when I left here and left London and ended up in Delhi some weeks and <laughs> many scary adventures being kidnapped and all sorts of things in, in Iran and so on. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful time and it, it's, it's lovely to hear some of the stories of how that went on. Keith John was here even then and um, wonderful memories of that he shared with, with his council. Colette and Foster, these mm. early people who really got got the course going. I think um, I think Joe, you, you might know, he was one of the first ones in here for the courses. I think he was perhaps the third year in the right. um, But what else? Well, absolutely, and, and one of the things I just wanted to do with this session was to just open up memories, really, because I think you've possibly all suddenly gone, oh yeah, or yeah, but we did, the, you know, so when, when you leave here today, just chat and think about those wonderful memories. And Dorothy and Leonard Alpers, we owe them so much. Yeah. You know, we really do. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Tim. It's so lovely to be able to chat with you and to have you all here. Thank you so much. Um, one final thing. We have a birthday boy. Happy birthday. <laughs> so let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday,